Good morning, and thank you for joining us this session at the Paris Peace Forum on a Saturday uh, morning. And so this session is entitled Measuring Impact, Tracking the Unquantifiable. So this is about measuring a company's social, social environmental, and right-related impact and performance. And we, this is also to ensure that corporate accountability to make capitalism fairer and more sustainable, more inclusive economy. So well, most of us maybe try to change our individual behavior to try to address some of the global challenges, we know that what can really make a, a difference, of course, is how companies behave. And we know that the private sector has an enormous potential to drive change. Uh, but we know that there is currently no global accountability mechanism. It all really relies on what the companies want to report. And we know that ESG, this environmental, social and governance is the buzzword or the buzz acronym uh, at the moment. Uh, it's very inconsistent on how they report. There's no agreed benchmark. It's a very inconsistent standard. Um, but thankfully, uh, we have speakers today that are working on solutions and how uh, we can come up with some uh, solutions. And let me introduce them uh, here, these panelists. We have uh, Catherine Horwitz, who's chief executive at Share Action. Share Action is a UK registered charity that aims to improve corporate behavior on environmental, social, and governance issue. We also have Paulina Murphy, engagement director at World Benchmarking Alliance, which is also a nonprofit organization, and she leads uh, the WBA's advocacy. Uh, an outreach strategy by building and strengthening relationships with stakeholders, investors, civil society, and governments. We also have Ethan Rouen, faculty co-chair, impact uh, co-chair, impact-weighted accounts project at the Harvard Business School. Um, he, he, cre he creates financial accounts reflecting a company's financial, social, and, and environmental performance. And finally, a voice from business with Philippe Heim, the CEO of the Banque Postale, who's a subsidiary on the French National Postal Service that is owned by the French government, La Poste. So um, let me uh, give the mic to you guys so you can tell us um, briefly what you do. Let me start with Catherine. And uh, what share action do in general? And what is the Workforce Disclosure Initiative in particular? Thank you, Charlotte, and good morning, everybody. Uh, fantastic to be here at the Paris Peace Forum. So Share Action is a, an NGO that's been tracking the performance on sustainability of the largest investors, asset managers, pension funds, insurance companies, and really trying to drive up performance and ambition in the global investment community, recognizing that big investors have enormous influence over the corporate performance in ESG. The Workforce Disclosure Initiative is a, is a specific um, project that we launched five years ago to, to improve, radically improve the quality of disclosures from the world's largest listed companies when it comes to a huge range of metrics that help us understand how people, human capital, are managed, both in direct operations of companies and in the global supply chain. And I'm pleased to say that the Workforce Disclosure Initiative is backed by a huge coalition of large investors who recognize that people management by companies is a material issue. It matters to the bottom line and the long-term success of companies. And also, of course, it matters to the workers. And part of you know, our corporate responsibility and investor responsibility is to really get a bit deeper into how companies manage people and use the power and leverage that investors have to improve performance in a way that both manages long-term risks, financially speaking, and also improves the lives of workers. So WGI has been going up for about five years, and we're really pleased that we have um, over 170 of the world's largest companies from Toyota and Microsoft, and over half of the CAC 40 companies are disclosing detailed information to the WGI about how they manage people across the world. So it's, this is an initiative which is scaling, but all the time what we're trying to do is ensure that this influences the development of global mandatory corporate reporting standards. And people will be aware that there's a lot of dynamic development in that space, partly driven or significantly driven by the climate agenda. But I see a really promising time now 
to drive these kind of voluntary initiatives like WDI, which have been path breaking and bring all that knowledge and understanding about how companies can report and proving that they can and will report and taking that to the regulatory authorities in a wide range of countries, like the Japanese are looking at this, the Indian government is looking at this, the European Commission has an ambitious program on corporate reporting of sustainability. So this is how we see the voluntary and leading into higher mandatory standards. So I'm very optimistic about this agenda at the moment. And I think the NGO community, I'm very proud of what we've done at Share Action and can't wait to hear what Paulina has to say. But we're working closely in a really interesting way with the, the, with the investment community to create a much, much richer picture of what's really going on in the ground in the way that companies manage human capital. Well, let me precisely bring in Paulina then. Um, Paulina, tell us more about the World Benchmarking Alliance and the different types of benchmarks that you guys work on. Thank you, Charlotte. And thank you, Catherine. Lovely to see you on, uh, and to be on this panel. Um, global leaders at the Paris Peace Forum have talked much about the interconnectedness of our economies. And this is, has, of course, always been a key characteristic of the SDGs. And it's impossible to focus on one SDG without having an impact on another. And the pandemic has reinforced the point that our lives are shaped by the deep interconnectedness of people, governments, companies, and the environment. It's also reinforced the point that the private sector is an absolute critical delivery partner in all of this. And there's lots of business activity and commitments, and uh, we, we can welcome much of the progress that we've seen at COP26. That's just that th this year has highlighted just how far we've come since the Paris Agreement was set and, uh, and how business and finance have been involved in some of the solutions. But of course, these are political agendas and they don't naturally lend themselves to business-led systemic transformation. There are no specific company actions that have been spelled out by governments. That's really been left up, left up to the business to sort out and, and organisations like Share Actions, as we just heard from, from Catherine. So it's not really easy to see what the, whether the business commitments at COP will provide the right focus for actual systemic transformation. Um, at WBA, we've been trying to work on this translation piece. So we're, we're about three years old. Uh, we were launched at the fringes of the UN General Assembly, and, and our, our purpose is to drive uh, business progress towards the SDGs and leave no one behind through incentivizing um, business to take the right actions and, and embed sustainability at the core of, of everything that they do. Um, so we take the SDGs and uh, the uh, Paris Agreement as our North Star, and we go through a full consultation to scope out the landscape of each of our systems and uh, to look at what targets have been already agreed, uh, scientific um, uh, targets and, and uh, planetary boundaries, uh, what disclosure expectations have already been set out, for example, the TCFD, other initiatives, other indicators that have been spelled out, and then also the societal expectations um, uh, of, of companies and how they're expected to perform on this agenda. This consultation then produces a methodology which we use to assess the companies we've identified within each of our systems. The methodology can be a tool for companies to identify the priorities for action, looking at that systemic transformation um, piece and the impact that they have. Uh, on the back of our uh, data collection, uh, based on that methodology, we then produce a benchmark and a ranking. And all of the information um, that we that we produce, um, that the score for each company and the ranking itself is um, free and publicly available. Um, in our uh, ecosystem of companies, there are 2,000 global companies that are the most powerful and influential to be able to contribute to the SDG agenda. Of course, their impact can be both negative and positive, but that's what we try to identify within the, within the scoring that we do. The 2,000 companies are measured according to their system-based transformation. Um, so, for example, the high emitting sectors are in the energy and decarbonisation system. Uh, tel telecoms companies, uh, we look at from a digital inclusion system perspective, and food retailers and restaurants, um, food processors are in the food and agriculture system. So in terms of concrete metrics, 
we have, for example, 45 indicators to measure 350 food and agriculture companies in the food value chain. Um, and this, the 45 indicators sit across the environmental, social governance and nutrition pillars. And I think it's important to say that every company, whether it's oil and gas, automotive, financial, food, retail or apparel, they'll also be measured, they will all be measured on their social impacts. Um, as we've heard from Catherine, that's absolutely critical in terms of the SDG agenda and leaving no one behind. So human rights, gender, social protection, ethical behaviour of the company. Um, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that the participation within our benchmarking is not voluntary at all. And um, we identify the companies that have that dominance within their supply chain and they're, they're then included regardless of their ownership structure, geographic location or willing, willingness to participate in the benchmarking process. This is really important so that we get a holistic picture across the business and supply chain and ensures that all key players in specific industries are assessed and are held to account uh, for their systemic impact. As you said in your um, opening remarks, um, Charlotte, this is to try to enable the sort of accountability mechanism to um, ensure that uh, everybody understands what companies are doing and what their commitments are contributing to. And that seems really crucial because I heard an ESG specialist at a large European bank just this week, and let me quote what he said, he said, we are ESG illiterate at this point in time. It is very hard to assess the quality of a company when faced with a myriad of key performance indicators. We are totally unable to figure out whether a company has a quality operation from an ESG point of view. That's really concerning considering what's at stake here. So the kind of work that you guys do seems incredibly valuable in giving some sort of benchmark to measure really what uh, the impact of this of these companies um, let me bring in uh, Ethan um, you also try to turn all this into numbers and you create financial accounts reflecting a company's financial social and environmental performance uh, tell us a bit more about your work yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Charlotte. And that's actually a perfect segue uh, for what we're doing, because instead of trying to teach business leaders the language of ESG, we actually try to translate the language of ESG into a language that investors and business leaders speak. So at the Impact Rated Accounts Project, what we do is think across the impact of a firm on employees, their customers and the environment. And instead of using the metrics that are used traditionally used in this language, we try to convert this into financial language. We actually attach dollar values to this impact across three pillars, product, environment, and employment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so in order to do this, we rely on cutting edge research as well as various data processes to basically think about converting, for example, carbon emissions into the dollar impact that, ha that those carbon emissions cause. And we think of this as having numerous benefits over the current language of ESG disclosures. First, it's very scalable. This can be applied to the smallest firm and the largest firms. Second, it's also um, applicable across the economy. So we have investors such as BlackRock that are using this as a screening tool. And we also have managers who are using it as a decision tool. Firms have finite resources. And in order to uh, determine what are the lowest hanging fruits, which are the initiatives that will have the greatest environmental or social impact, converting it into dollars allows them to compare across different potential initiatives. Lastly, it also helps the academic community and researchers in general. Here, we're creating data sets, large scale data sets for numerous, for thousands and thousands of companies in uh, identifying their environmental and employment impact. We are showing that this actually matters for firms. We show that along the environment, firms that have lower environmental impact, basically they're better for the environment, also have uh, greater returns and greater valuation. On the employment side, firms that create po more positive employment impact make basically firms that are better for their employees, have lower turnover and higher valuations. And we make these data sets available to researchers for two reasons. First, our methodology is constantly evolving. We know we don't have the answer. We know this is an iterative process. And so by sharing our data, sharing our work with the research community and with the business, business community, we get feedback on how to improve our methodology. And second, we're learning more about why this impact measure matters. Basically, we use our methodology. We, pitch our methodology to other researchers to think about the big issues that we haven't yet thought about. Thanks, Ethan. So now let's have a word from business. We have uh, Philippe Heim. Uh, 
FLSU have become the Bac Postal, an entreprise à mission, so a company with a purpose. Um, tell us what that means uh, exactly. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very pleased uh, to, uh, to participate to this edition of the World Peace Forum. And uh, maybe to answer to your question, let me first uh, look at the big picture. What, what is a matter of concern for me is first two questions. How can we uh, address the, the growing echo anxiety among young people? We know that 75% of those young people, they consider their future to be frightening due to uh, global warming. We see also, and we are directly in our subject, there is a, a growing distrust regarding all announcements made by corporates, and this sense there is some kind of porosity between communication and real uh, commitments. So we need to measure scientifically and to give proof. Uh, second question, so how can we curb this situation? We know we have a scientific uh, art proof that uh, global warming is 100% due to human activity. We know uh, then that we must stop ASAP all oil and gas developments if we want to meet the 1.5% uh, objective uh, by 2050. And this is, uh, you know, uh, what has been said in the report of the International uh, Energy Agency. So uh, now we must uh, roll our sleeve and we must uh, move forward and uh, walk the talk. And here let me uh, uh, share two core beliefs as a CEO of a bank. First one is that uh, there will be no decarbonation process without an active participation of banks. Second core belief, all market participants must act now quickly, swiftly, and not wait for regulators to impose them to, uh, to follow this route. So then, uh, what can we do? And uh, as a, a purpose-driven company, what uh, have we done uh, with La Banque Postale? First element to address this uh, distrust issue, uh, we have decided uh, to have uh, our trajectory to be net-net uh, neutral by uh, 2040, to be challenged by ONG, by external observers, and we have been very pleased to be the first uh, uh, international bank, so the first bank in the world, to have its trajectory to be scientifically um, proved and certified by the SBTI. So this is an element of, uh, of measurement, an element of proof. Uh, second, uh, we have decided to develop a wide set of green products to serve our clients, B2B, B2C, asset management, private banking, and maybe the most innovative one is regarding uh, B2C uh, products, with, for example, for example like I can develop uh, positive uh, impact consumer loans or dedicated loans uh, for the re renovation of low energy efficient properties. Uh, then, of course, we have decided and we're also the first bank to exit uh, from oil and gas activity by uh, 2030. And then, coming back to, to your point, we have decided also to change the way we are managing the bank by developing our in-house impact treating factor. You know that as a bank, when we have a credit committee or investment committee, what do we do concretely? We measure the risk of a loan or we measure the return of an investment. So we will apply a, a specific score uh, to measure the benefit of a, a loan, uh, the benefit of a project, according to three axes. Uh, the environment impact, uh, how to foster and how this project foster local development, and what is the social impact. And to be very, very specific, because there we need to be uh, specific and concrete. For example, for the environment uh, impact, we will use the European taxonomy. Uh, to measure the substantial contribution of this project. Regarding uh, the impact of local development, for example, among various uh, KPIs, we will measure the number of jobs uh, that are created or uh, uh, destroyed by this project. On the social axis, we will, for example, measure the number of hours dedicated to uh, the training of employees. And you see, globally, this is a way for us to have a, a score that will be embedded uh, in our decision to grant a loan or to invest in a project. Uh, this methodology will be uh, co-constructed with NGOs, with corporates and academics. 
It will be soon uh, uh, implemented, and this is just a matter of weeks, and we expect that uh, 1st of Jan will be uh, up and running. And uh, uh, long story short, responding to your questions, uh, Charlotte, this is a way to translate our strategy into concrete achievements uh, and our strategy to be a purpose loan company uh, and uh, in our raison d'être, hein, so uh, in our purpose, uh, we have an objective to accompany uh, the just transition and all those fractures we, we see in the society on the environment side, on the, the, the local side, on the social side and also on, on, on digital. Thank you, Philippe. So from what we've heard from all of you is you try to provide some tools for investors, uh, for example, to, to have a way to measure the impact of companies. Of course, as we said, we rely on the information that companies give or some of the tools that you guys give. Do we need a regulatory framework? Is that something that is even possible in the future? Who wants to jump in? I'll jump in first because in the US, oh, sorry. Um, right. I, I'll, I'll jump in very, very quickly um, because in the US, this is top of mind. The SEC is actually considering a regulatory framework to require disclosures among uh, for the environment and human capital. And we think this is necessary in part because firms are disclosing ESG related metrics right now, but there's little comparability across firms because firms are choosing what they disclose and therefore we need to better uh, better guide firms as to what can be valued, what, what should be disclosed in order to make it more comparable. Catherine, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly um, endorse that. So I, I think we absolutely need to evolve to a point where uh, companies are required, no questions required, to provide comparable and relatively granular information about their social and environmental impacts. And I'm very happy to say that I think um, the, the regulatory authorities and the lawmakers of the world have understood that. I do think things like the you know, the Paris Climate Agreement has been driving this whole agenda. Like, if we recognize the, the role and significance of private finance in helping to resolve some of the world's greatest challenges, and Philippe spoke very clearly and well to that, then um, the business community and the financial community cannot perform that function without the data to underpin and give some credibility to all of that. So uh, we are seeing really important regulatory developments, and we're, part of that is driven actually by this huge rise in responsible investment and ESG investing. That in turn is driven by consumer demand. You know, ordinary people who put money into the uh, have savings or, or pension uh, retirement incomes, they really want to invest sustainably. And so more and more you're seeing the big fund managers committing to responsible investment. And then they realize, well, we can't really do this without the data sets, without being able to genuinely compare companies in our portfolios against these metrics. So I think initiatives like the Workforce Disclosure Initiative and by the way, things like CDP have been pioneering to show this is doable, but we all want to hand off to globally comparable mandatory reporting standards for companies and I'm pleased that we're seeing just in the last week at, at, at the Glasgow COP, the uh, IFRS, um, International Re Financial Reporting Standard uh, Board, announcing um, an, their commitment to establish an international sustainability standard. Um, so th there, there are really positive developments in this space and it will transform the landscape to have companies reporting data in a comparable way. So the very old question, is it the carrot or the stick? What works better? Should we look at incentives or name and shame companies where we want them to disclose more transparently the, the impact on, on their financial reports, for example? Can I jump in? Yes, please. Yeah, is that okay? Thank you. I, I wanted to just provide a... I, I completely agree on the on the previous question, and and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the policy agenda, and then I'll I'll also look at the voluntary versus the carrot and the stick thing. Um, but if I go back to our um, uh, oil and gas benchmark, which we launched in July, which uh, looked at the performance of 100 companies um, in the oil and gas sector, 
um, the lead, leading company scored 57%. And now our benchmark is the first one to use the 1.5 scenario, which is based on the IEA net zero by 2050. Um, and we look at scope one, two, and three emissions. So we know it's a tough, it's a tough ambition and it is a tough uh, disclosure um, for the companies, but, uh, but we need to set that ambition and, um, and the roadmap for the company through that benchmark. And our key finding is that the, um, the 100 companies uh, would burn through the sector's 1.5 carbon budget by 2037. And there is a, this mentality of take what you can, uh, at, take what you can now, um, which is which is disastrous, as as we all know. Um, and then a few other uh, examples uh, from that benchmark: five out of 100 have climate expertise on boards only. That's not that's. You know, we need to do something about that. That's something that regulation can address, and I think that's the point. So, as well as the consistent disclosures um, that should be uh, made mandatory, and um, there is also this: what what can, if if we see this complete inaction from a company on specific issues like um, board expertise, then I think there is also um, a, a space for regulation re regulation to step into into that part too. Um, and then, and so I guess I've I've led myself to then also consider the next question, which is um, uh, on its own voluntary initi initiatives um, can go f as uh, can go far, but they don't. We do need uh, in parallel where we see that inactivity on behalf of the private sector. We do often need uh, uh, regulation to step in, and um, uh, I, I would say, of course, that um, it's not about. Um, uh, you know, we have a benchmark. We look at the leading practices. We look at the the companies that are lagging behind. And so there is also, from our point of view, we provide a little bit of the the stick um, as well as the carrot. If if we, uh, as, but it, in, it in needs um, our allies and the organisations who use the data to to support that and to actively engage with companies on on both sides of the of the benchmark. Thank you, Paulina. Anyone else want to jump in on this? I see Philippe wants to say something. Yes, maybe, maybe Charlotte, just to, to come back to your questions. Uh, I, I think it's very important for, for banks and market participants to be uh, proactive. Huh? Uh, just uh, maybe to, 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 to explain, given the horizon of specific investment huh, in, uh, in energy, so we are talking of investment along an horizon of 15 to 20 years. So it's, it's, uh, of com compuls it's compulsory now to, to act and, and have uh, one again proactive policies uh, to meet the 1.5 uh, degrees target by 2050. And we see that uh, uh, regulators are already uh, tackling the issue. Uh, we, uh, in the financial sector, we consider that climate is a systemic risk, and uh, ECB, but also the Fed, is applying a climate stress test, and I think this is uh, very uh, positive. Uh, and uh, the Basel Committee itself and the European Commission, we are working uh, on, uh, for example, metrics uh, to impose, for example, green supporting factor uh, to, uh, to adjust uh, the, the weight of capital we put uh, in specific projects, or brown penalizing factor. Uh, so it will be maybe introduced uh, in the Basel III uh, package uh, that uh, is proposed by the Commission and will be submitted to, to the European Parliament. If we stay back one moment, what is very important if we want to maybe follow this route, it has been already addressed uh, by, by the panel, uh, first, we need to talk the same language. So in that sense, the European taxonomy is of paramount importance. So we need to be able uh, to use the same concept and to understand uh, with the same content, uh, let's say, what, uh, what we're talking about. And second, there is a, a critical issue about data. Uh, and we need uh, data that are certified uh, that we could inject in our scoring tools. Thank you. Can I go back on the oil and gas uh, industry that uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier? I mean, several banks have announced that they would stop providing financing uh, and services to the sectors, including uh, La Banque Postale. There's a bit of a debate on this because, of course, it is 
thousands of jobs. And so, you know, in the ESG, there's the S as well. And it's a social impact of what it is and moving away from this industry. So um, some said actually stopping the financing of some of these industries is not helpful and actually carry on financing them so they evolve and transform that industry. What, what's your view on that? Uh, maybe start with Philip. Yes, of course. So we have decided uh, ourselves huh, to stop uh, all uh, oil and gas financing by 2030, uh, both on conventional and non-conventional side. So this is a clear-cut uh, announcement. Uh, uh, let, let me say that this is a response to the urgency of uh, the situation. Uh, at the end of the day, if we want uh, to meet the agenda of the COP21, we must act now. Uh, and then um, my belief is that we, we need to be confident. There is a positive Schumpeterian movement. So we will force banks or companies to change their business model. And at the end of the day, I'm sure that we will find proper solutions. We have seen in the past also a very bold moves, uh, a very significant change in the industry. Uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the bank space, but also in all the kind of uh, sectors. So I'm confident that those jobs will be transferred to other parts of the economy. Catherine, can I get your view on this? Because I know that Share Action has been quite active on that front as well. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I can only agree with Philippe that we do need to have very, very tough, very urgent action to scale back the financing of the fossil fuel industry. And I commend uh, the La, La Banque Postale for taking a really leading role um, and position within the global banking community. But at the same time, you're absolutely right, Charlotte, that there will be winners and losers in the workforce and in communities as a result of this transition. Overall, there will be more job creation. The green transition is a fantastically jobs-rich transition. But there's no question that for specific industries and communities, there could be some real short-term challenges. And we do need bold public policy backed by the investment community to ensure that there are transition packages for communities and, uh, and for, for workforce, that people get you know, financial support to retrain, maybe financial support to actually move um, geographically into an area where there's lots of job growth. So I do think we will um, threaten the pace of transition, which we so urgently need to undergo if we forget the communities and the workforce. And that brings me back a little bit to the S of ESG, because you're so right, Charlotte, that it is the neglected piece. And actually, that's unsustainable. We cannot have um, a credible low carbon transition or address the biodiversity crisis either without remembering communities, whether it's the workforce, in the Western world or its indigenous communities in parts of the world that are protecting, um, you know, very fragile uh, biodiversity. So the S of ESG is a Cinderella area. And I hope that post the COP, which has really galvanized the global financial community to make some big commitments, which I'm really pleased about, but we now really shift our attention to the S of ESG and we see a similar galvanizing and powerful movement that we've seen on climate in the financial community, we now see it for um, the, the social stakeholders of companies, because if we forget them, then we've got really big problems. Yes, I was exactly going to ask you about this. It seems at the moment there's a lot of focus on what a company will do. Hey, they're making electric cars and less on how they do it, you know, less on the pay and the equality and the, the, the diversity in those companies, et cetera, et cetera. So are you, are you concerned that we're kind of losing sight a little bit on that side of, of things? Uh, maybe Ethan. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's a it's a false trade off. It, it, it's like suggesting that, um, you know, in the early 20th century, we shouldn't have allowed cars on the road because it would risk putting the horse and buggy drivers out of work. We should just give these horse and buggy drivers driver's licenses and train them for the future. And we're dealing with the same thing here. And I think that's why measurement is so important, because we under not only understand the trade offs and can actually document these trade offs and compare them, but we can also think about we can identify where where to invest in the future you know in, in a sense when we contemplate environmental impact you know financial performance is a lagging indicator but 
when we think about you know quantifying the impact in terms of the environmental impact, in terms of employment impact, that's where we're thinking about you know what's what the future is going to look like. That's where we can actually forecast where the growth is going to be. And so along those lines, I, I think that it, it's very important to measure the S and measure the E and make you know, policy decisions, make employment decisions, make training decisions based on these measures as opposed to on financial measures at this point. I'm going to play to be the devil's advocate here, but um, we've heard there is an ESG premium at the moment, and investors are really keen on finding companies that report well and that are very transparent on, on this front. So do we need really a regulatory framework if investors um, themselves are just really keen to, to find the companies that are doing things well? Is that not an encouragement enough for companies to do things well? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, um, I, I think I think we do. I don't think that that's sufficient. I mean, first of all, you have the market for lemons problems. You have company, you know, the best companies are allegedly disclosing, but there's also a monitoring problem here because most of these ESG activities aren't observable to investors. The in the United States, any ESG disclosures are. Um, are non audited or not audited. You know, we have there. There was a recent study that showed that companies that are talking about ESG issues in their regulatory filings are using almost exclusively boilerplate language. They're not do, talking about any specifics because of the lit litigation risk. Whereas you have these hundreds of pages long ESG reports where they're talking about all the great things they're doing, and yet a they get to choose what they're talking about, and b they're talking about stuff that we can't see and that's unaudited. So yeah, I, I think that I would push back and say that we do need regulation here. So do we need to have- I totally agree. Yeah. So audited, like they have their financials audited. Do we need auditors to look at the ESG credentials of companies? And some people I've heard say, oh my God, if the future of the world relies on auditors, we are doomed anyway. So just give me your- <laughs> Yes, we need auditors. We need we need that skill set applied to these pressing problems. And I think it's a great regret that that hasn't happened, but I'm excited that it now has. And, and by the way, the big audit companies of the world are rapidly um, recruiting ESG specialists, climate scientists, people with the, with the relevant expertise. And yeah, we do need rigorous, standardized, auditable um, disclosures because, quite honestly, as, as Ethan said, it's all a bit of a Wild West at the moment where companies cherry pick their best stories and then provide information um, that's really not financially usable by analysts in the, in the financial community. So that, that needs to stop. But one thing I will say is that Let's say for, 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 for climate and environmental um, disclosures, we absolutely should have that um, influenced by, by, by scientific credibility and you know, by, by really rigorous science-based approach. For the S of ESG, we need a slightly different approach. I think we really need stakeholder voices that feed into the development of these methodologies. We need workers, we need unions, we need communities. There are, there are ways, and I think civil society organizations, including my own, are quite good at tapping into that, you know, frontline expertise, lived experience that needs to influence and then be translated into, as Ethan was saying, the kind of hard, rigorous, um, comparable, numerical approach that investors can use. But let's not forget the real people and their experience, because it's a, it's a valuable input to get the right approach here. I guess I want to ask you one of the challenges on this is a potentially a regulatory framework coming into, say, regulators, whether in the US or in Europe, are looking at integrating some of these criteria. But uh, because we know that nothing is going to really change if we don't have those big other industrial powers uh, like India or China on board. And what's the challenge there on trying to get some of these uh, frameworks and benchmarks um, also adopted in some of these countries? Maybe Polina, you can help us. Sure. I, I did want to just, I, so auditing is incredibly important, but then there is a danger that the conversation becomes very institutional and it's an, you know, the, the accountability is provided by the accountancy firms and, it, and there's, there isn't that mechanism to bring in the uh, affected uh, communities and the, and the affected workers. So I, absolutely reinforced the last point that Catherine made about the importance of good dialogue. And actually, um, we we looked at um, the 180 uh, high um, 
emitting uh, companies that we had previously assessed, assessed on the on the energy transition, we then uh, just a few weeks ago published uh, just transition assessments also for those 180 companies. And what we found was that there is a uh, lack of action on social, as we've all heard, um, and the most affected people are excluded uh, from that decision making. So um, we need a much better um, rigorous dialogue between the company um, and the stakeholders, particularly the workers and the communities affected. And I think that's the that's the point also about the um, the other regions, uh, India, as an example, um, and, and the people who who are often most affected and who need the most uh, directed uh, support and engagement by the private sector are the most marginalised. Um, and India is is one, but there are many other countries. And so to really understand the communities in those countries and bring that into the conversations within the boardroom with the investor community um, and for that to be featured in the regulatory frameworks that are set by the EU or other of the uh, or the, uh, the US administration um, or the often the, the lead like the EU is obviously taking a lead uh, in the in the uh, um, corporate reporting landscape with the various initiatives that are underway but it has to also take into account the, the voices of those um, uh, workers that are currently unrepresented. And we know from COP that, um, uh, you know, the, the big uh, jurisdictions that needed to be there were not there. So I don't know how, I don't know how we can do it, um, but it's, it's absolutely critical that that's where we start to focus our, our joint efforts. We just have a few minutes left, so let me just bring up a, a question that we got uh, from the audience. Let me read it to you. Uh, in your opinion, what are the changes that need to be implemented in organizations and companies to encourage actions beyond what the law stipulates, both externally and internally? There's a question from Jeanette, who would like to pick this one up. I'm, I'm happy to speak, to, uh, just to open that up. I think what, what really matters is that um, the boards of companies are fully engaged with this agenda, that they are appointing really senior people who report directly to the chief executive with responsibility for social and environmental reporting, management, um, and, and, and impact improvement. And I think that there's a hugely important role for investors in large companies to insist on boards of directors that have the right skills and also senior executives reporting to CEOs that have the right skills and the mandate, you know, the power and resource and have proper teams that can get that can do this work. And, and, and so I'm, you know, I think the answers are, are relatively simple. We just need to make sure that this is very, very clearly on the board agenda and that investors are backing that up. And then the, resu the right resources are there in the company to, to drive the change because we know it's doable. Like there's best practice across the corporate landscape. Um, and it's what we just need is a kind of rapid acceleration of a catch up where the laggards catch up with the leaders. And by the way, I am a big fan of naming and shaming. I do think it really, really moves things along. Be aware out there. <laughs> um, just a, a final one, because of course, all this, uh, as we say in the introduction, is that to ensure corporate accountability to make capitalism fairer and more sustainable. And this is really what's at stake here. Is it about the future of capitalism and make sure it can continue, maybe even? I, I think it's grander than that. Yes, I think it's about the future of capitalism and making sure that we we fix the, the flaws, particularly the pricing of externalities in the market or the lack thereof at this point. But it's bigger than that. It's not just capitalism. It's society and civilization as a whole that needs to be addressed, that needs to be helped and saved here because, you know, we can't outrun climate change without serious actions. And we can't take those serious actions without understanding what needs to be done by me through measurement. Philippe, would you like to add a word to this? Because you are the voice of, of, of business here to, to a certain extent. Sure, sure. As a purpose-driven company, we are very aware of uh, the impact we have on society. That's why we have decided uh, as a purpose uh, to, let's say, to say that uh, our uh, main objective is to accompany the just transition. So uh, to measure the impact we have globally on society through the, the axis I, I described previously, environment, 
local development, <coughs> social impact. So I think this is very important. That's why we need the proper governance. And maybe I just want to mention something in the previous question. I just want to, to mention One minute. that there is an interaction. Yes, 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 but in two, 10 seconds, there is an interaction between uh, the, the flow uh, of money through a green asset and monetary policy. And according to the, uh, the Bank of International Settlement, we have currently 35 billions of green assets and there is a bubble and we need to be aware of that. A, a, a word of, of caution here. Uh, thank you very much for all these, uh, for this conversation that was really interesting. So Catherine Oros from Share Action, Paulina Murphy for the World Benchmarking Alliance, Ethan Wong from the Harvard Business School and Philip Heim from the Banque Postale. Thank you very much for joining the Paris Peace Forum. Thank you. It was great. Pleasure. Back here at the studio in the last day and almost the last hours of the fourth edition of the Paris Peace Forum. Uh, very happy to do this uh, last segment where we're talking about the project, uh, about initiatives, about sessions. But we have a special guest for that final session. Yes, so Ronia has been part of the Paris Peace Forum journey also from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, you've had various roles within the framework of Paris Peace Forum. and this this year, you've organized a very interesting workshop on the sidelines. So could you perhaps just uh, tell us a little bit more about what the work has been? Um, you represent one of our founding members, that is the Koba Shiftung Foundation, whose support we've been incredibly grateful to have. So perhaps if you could tell us uh, how the journey has been over the past four years, real quick, and specifically, what have you been up to for the past two, three days? Of course, very happy to do so. Thanks for having me here. So, as you said, my name is Ronja. I work with Kerber Stiftung, one of the founding members, and we've been here in this uh, exciting endeavor from the very beginning. Every year, we've organized one thing or the other to be an active member of the Paris Peace Forum community. We've hosted some discussions on various global governance issues. In 2019, you know, the last actual physical um, Paris Peace Forum we had before the pandemic, we hosted uh, a, a workshop, a policy exercise, where we tried to really look into the future in order to come up with some innovative ideas on how we can improve governance on back then the issue of water governance and the, the link to migration and conflict. But this idea was really to, to look ahead and to generate new ideas. And this very much drove um, the workshop that we have conceptualized and implemented this year. It was a foresight workshop with altogether 60 participants from around the world um, where we discussed the future of global governance of artificial intelligence. So that everybody un understands. So this has been going on for the last two days. Uh, starting uh, on, on Thursday, uh, yesterday, Friday, and this morning, uh, uh, Saturday. And it mobilized uh, many uh, resources, but more importantly, 60 participants taken from the overall uh, uh, batch of the uh, thousands of participants that took uh, uh, part in it. And it was organized in three sessions. Is that right? That is correct. So there was an open call to all participants of the Paris Peace Forum to participate in this and we received a bunch of excellent applications from civil society, from the private sector, from policy and so on and so forth. And we selected uh, the best ones from all continents and we brought them together in three sessions. Um, I'm in fact just here five minutes after the close of the final session. So I still have lots of ideas on my mind, but there it was a really a co-creative process where the first group took off with some ideas and some trends that we already see in artificial intelligence linked to critical infrastructures, to border management, to the future of like north-south relations and so forth. They gave it to a second group and a third group and we didn't really know what they would make from it and where we would end up. But now here I am after three sessions and full of ideas still working out what we're going to take from this. Can you, can you tell 
tell us about the larger context, the larger, uh, let's say, conceptual context. What are, what are the, the urgent questions that we should ask about our future and AI to, to sort of speak more in plain language? What, what is the danger, in other words, uh, that you uh, sort of uh, uh, did the scenario around or the, uh, uh, or the exercise around? I mean, it's probably fair to say that emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, are the biggest game changer that our generation and that future generations will face. Um, I think there's this famous saying about it might be the greatest innovation of humankind. It might also be the last one, the, the future of artificial intelligence. And that's why we, why we chose this particular issue, but also because we see emerging tech taking off really fast and the governance of this really lagging behind so if you if you extrapolate into the future this gap is becoming even even bigger so we have to follow up with new ideas with some innovative thoughts on how we can do better on governing this space you know can i ask you because uh, the thing is uh, ai will never be consumers at the end of the day right uh, so now that you've done this foresight does the future look good does it look bleak uh, are you left with hope after this workshop and I'm definitely left with hope because there are, it's really, it's a breath of ideas that people came up with. So there is so many good solutions around. We only have to harvest them and have share to, maybe one to, or two. I, I can definitely do this. What I, what I want to say is that we started out from very different policy areas, but the conversations really converged around um, very similar issues in all the groups that discussed. It's about trust. It's about generating trust among citizens in technologies, but also in governments and in decision makers. It's about bringing people on board, bringing civil society on board in crafting these solutions. And it's about strengthening relations between different sectors. And I think that very much resonates with the DNA of the forum, where, where all these different stakeholders come together in thinking about the future of governance. So have you reached policy conclusions, because uh, uh, PPF is all about governance, it's all about designing good policies, it's all about launching initiatives and, and uh, trying to remedy perhaps the lack of governance that may be, uh, etc. And so after the three days uh, of this uh, foresight exercise, uh, have you reached con policy conclusions uh, as to where we might need to, to go? We definitely have. Um, I, can, I can tell you we have like an online white board that is full of ideas and very concrete solutions that we will work out in, in the coming month, I should say this. So there will be a digital report being published where we communicate them also to the, to the broader public and uh, to decision makers. In fact, um, we will share some more specific um, recommendations in a public session at 2.15 this afternoon. But I want to share one because it struck, uh, it really struck me that this is a, a recommendation that has been valid for years now, but we have to increase tech literacy among decision makers. I think it's not only about citizens understanding what's going on, but it is really about the public sector and our authorities knowing what's going on and understanding the technologies. I think we've all seen the videos where we've had uh, parliamentarians talk to people from the tech world and kind of ask them the sort of questions that, you know, uh, Gen Z or millennials look at and go, how do you not know what's going on? So can I ask you then, because a lot of the work we do at Paris Peace Forum and COBA shifting is to build resilient infrastructure, right? Is to empower governance, to keep up with the days uh, and challenges of today. So how exactly are you going to take the learnings from this forum and have that those be implemented? What can we expect to be done with the results that you gain from the next from this day? Yeah, I can be a bit more uh, specific on this. So first of all, we will have to digest really the breadth and the thousands of ideas that came up and sort them and, and work them out. And we will have some partners from academia um, that will also help us, uh, help us make sense of it. But what we want to do eventually is not come up with yet another PDF report that some people might download and never read, but we really want to come up with a kind of interactive platform online that is accessible to as many people as we can. So in order to have citizens on board and to learn and understand about the issues that all of us will be confronted with, but also disseminate this to decision makers around the world to help them get a better understanding about the issues they will have to regulate. Mm -hmm. 
Can I ask you, do you think that the, uh, the, the method that you used, that these uh, uh, type of exercise, uh, 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 or whether you know, it would be more like a scenario exercise, more like an anticipation exercise, uh, uh, a, a role, uh, a g game of um, uh, you know, war gaming or peace gaming, as we, as we say at some point, uh, is, is it useful to understand things that perhaps we could not reach in a panel session or in a discussion? What, what is your reflection on that? It is absolutely key, I think, to use this, these collaborative formats if you want to come up with very specific ideas. I think in, in panel discussions, what often happens is that people come with their ready-made answers in a way, and they, they have their state to share them, and there is worth in this. So, I mean, definitely that, that is a good format. But if you, if you want to crowdsource ideas, you need collaborative space. and, uh, and we used to do this pre-COVID in workshop rooms, you know, with white walls and sticky notes. And now there are lots of formats that can be done online. And it, this enabled us really to bring in people from around the world. We had to be mindful of time zones, I say. But um, we gave them space to exchange on an equal footing. You know, you, we had people from policy. We had um, students. We had civil society. We had private sector. and people who wouldn't normally be in the same room. And I think sitting on a panel, they would speak next to each other, but not with each other. And um, at, at Kerber Stiftung, this idea of talking with each other and not about one another is a key message that we really want to make part of all the, all the things we do. And I think that's what also drove the workshop. Wonderful. So, so uh, let me say again: uh, if you want to have the more substantial uh, conclusions of the uh, uh, of the workshop of the, the formidable uh, work that has been done in the past three days by Ronia and the whole uh, team, uh, it's at 2:15, right? Uh, it will be a, a digital uh, a stage um, uh, focusing on the results of that uh, foresight workshop on AI and uh, uh, and and our future with uh, AI uh, uh, to uh, to follow. Uh, now let's transition, I guess, to unfortunately already wrapping up uh, what will be uh, this fourth edition and la the next few hours. We still have a few uh, fascinating sessions to go. Uh, the blue economy on the oceans, uh, reforming capitalism, uh, uh, something really interesting on the role of companies in the new, I would say, political uh, context. But we most importantly have the closing ceremony. Yes. Um, so Ronia has uh, been, uh, I, I remember, our journey of choosing projects uh, in, I think, the first year yes. uh, where we went through so many applications that we got and chose projects. And this year we have 80 projects, again, that another team had the responsibility to do, uh, where they chose 80 projects out of over 330 applications that came in. Yes, even more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So out of very many applications that we received and we had 80 projects, 30 of whom could be here in person with us, the rest of them joined us digitally. And out of this cohort, we have chosen 10 projects. Not to say that these 10 projects are in any way better than the other, but it's just uh, sort of the best aligned with uh, how we can support them further over the course of a year under the initiative Scale Up. Um, do you perhaps just want to give a little bit of what that experience would be like for them for the next uh, year? And we will announce them today at the closing ceremony and have another great lineup of speakers Absolutely. who will be closing the ceremony for us. So perhaps just then you want to have the last word to just tell the people what that would be about. Absolutely. So so, so on the one hand, uh, we'll be announcing the 10 projects. And what the Scale-Up Committee does is it uh, 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 supports this project through a system of mentorship during over the course of a full year with uh, help on visibility, with help on communication, with help on networking, and I would say almost lobbying, you could say, uh, putting them in touch with people that they uh, uh, will uh, benefit from. Uh, also giving them advice on how to run the project. So we, we're trying to have a, a range of uh, uh, types of support that we are uh, giving them. And so uh, already 30 of them have benefited from the program since we've had three cohorts of 10 projects, and we'll announce the 10 next uh, this afternoon. But after that, and that's something new that we had not experimented so far, we'll have a uh, session that we wanted to devote to COP26. You know, obviously, this year the forum was 
synchronized, but that was by, by chance, with, the, uh, with COP26 and with the end of COP26 in particular, which was uh, supposed to end last, uh, 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 last night. Uh, what we wanted to do on this Saturday, uh, November 13, was to have a, an assessment of where do things stand? Was the COP26 a success or a uh, failure or something in between? And more importantly, because that's where we are always, uh, that's what we're always thinking about, where do we go next? And so we'll have a number of interesting speakers on the issue, uh, starting with John Kerry, uh, the US uh, presidential envoy on climate, speaking us live from Glasgow. He will be able to tell us about the results of COP26. Uh, We'll also have uh, Minister Wang Rongqi, uh, who is the Minister for Environment of China, giving us his assessment. Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General of the UN, uh, who will be uh, uh, addressing us and giving us his, his assessment. And the uh, uh, European Investment Bank, Ver uh, Mr. Werner Hoyer, uh, who will be giving us the European point of view on how it went at, uh, 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 in Glasgow. So stay tuned at 4.30, from 4.30 to 5.30 uh, p.m. Uh, for this closing ceremony. Yes, and we also have a very important uh, person here with us, which is, I think, the youngest attendee we have at the forum, Ronia's baby, <laughs> uh, is here. I wish you could see her. So thank you so much, Ronia, for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the closing ceremony. Thank you to all. Thank you. And see you soon.